Okay, thank you, Glenn. And, uh, oops, I guess as a place to start, uh, yes, I wanna thank Glenn for pulling this together and for David for pulling this off and the Foundation's Recovery Network and all the sponsors for allowing this to actually happen today. I, uh, I'm um, communicating with you today live from my home in Durham, North Carolina. Welcome to my home, welcome to Durham, nice to have you. For some of you, I was actually hoping to meet you and join, uh, join you in, in this conference in San Diego. It was a great week for that, I'm sure. However, circumstances being what they are, my greatest hope for everyone right now is that everybody and, and your families are, are safe and, and in good health. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. So this is indeed a talk on intensive outpatient treatment of substance use disorders. However, this is a conference that's really focused on recovery, which, which is principally what this is really all about. And so I, I think uh, before I actually start with the presentation on intensive outpatient treatment, I, I'd like to perhaps offer some perspective. Uh, this was uh, developed by a, a close mentor of mine, passed away a few years ago, John Edwards, wrote a wonderful book, uh, Working with Families. And in this overview, he describes the difference between what treatment is and what recovery is. And I just thought that'd be a good way to start this, this session. So uh, he describes treatment here is, of course, getting sober, recovery, getting well. Treatment, a professional service. Recovery, a way of life. Treatment, breaking through denial. Recovery, practicing honesty. Treatment, short-term or intermittent. Recovery, lifelong. Treatment, often involuntary. Recovery, always voluntary. Treatment, getting started. Recovery, getting real. Treatment, structure-oriented. Recovery, process-oriented. And treatment, an inconvenient step. Recovery, a leap of faith. So the session today is intended to offer a, a, a bit of an overview of what, what is intensive outpatient treatment, particularly the goal here is to describe, you know, kind of what it is. Um, and, and also a little bit about what it's not. Sometimes that makes it clear about what it is. To review the research-based principles of intensive outpatient treatment, to discuss who might be best served by intensive outpatient treatment, to identify the elements of an effective intensive outpatient program, and to recognize the clinical and administrative issues and challenges of intensive outpatient treatment. I'll probably just use the acronyms IOP or IOT for they're fairly interchangeable as we go through this discussion. So I do have a couple of resources I'd like to uh, really recommend as, as principally the sources for this presentation. And, and I guess I, I, I hope this will show, but I've got a couple of props. This is, uh, for those of you familiar with the SAMHSA TIP series, Treatment Improvement Protocols, developed through the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment. This is actually one of the early ones, uh, number eight. And um, uh, this is, uh, was uh, developed in 1992 uh, by uh, a consensus panel of uh, folks who were actually doing work in the field in intensive outpatient treatment. At that time, we didn't really, you know, we really didn't have a lot of research um, and uh, a lot of really, true, truthfully, back in, that, in the early 90s, a lot of clinical experience running these programs. So this was at the time, basically what we had. And I show it to you just if you can kind of see how how uh, slim it is, because it, it wasn't that substantial, but it, you know, it, it's what we knew at the time. And in 19, uh, I forget actually the year, but it's about 10 years later, uh, the panel, I think 19, um, 1992, I'd have to do the math, but early 2000 or so, the, the uh, consensus panel reconvened and we actually developed um, two uh, additional treatment improvement protocols, one addressing the administrative issues of intensive outpatient treatment, because one of the the basic tenets of this model is you've got to have a good business model. To, you know, the business of the business is all important, of course. And then we also had a very much a more substantial document on clinical issues in intensive outpatient treatment. And you can see uh, much more substantial because we had, a, at this point, a lot more experience and information about this model and how and why it works, you know, and, and what it is and so on and so forth. So these are, these are resources I, I certainly encourage you to, they're, they're free and downloadable online through the SAMHSA website. So I want to encourage you to access those uh, at your convenience if you're interested. So uh, there are a variety of definitions of, uh, sub, of, of what we mean by intensive outpatient programs, but this is a, a reasonable overview. 
uh, the service definition here is descri describes it as um, IOPs are uh, direct services for people with, uh, and I actually added moderate to severe substance use disorders or co-occurring mental and substance use disorders who do not require medical detoxification or 24-hour supervision. Uh, the program uh, uh, addresses uh, treatment for, uh, provides treatment for symptoms and or disabilities associated with the disorder. Uh, core services include, generally include a specified number of hours of structured programming per week, individual group and or family therapy, and psychoeducation about substance use and mental disorders. Their service goals, just like in traditional treatment, to learn the early stage relapse uh, management um, uh, process and some techniques, develop coping strategies, establish or reestablish psychosocial supports, address problems related to social, psychological, and emotional well-being, and intensive outpatient services, I'll elaborate on this in a little bit uh, later, can be delivered in a variety of settings. They can be hospital-based settings or traditional community-based settings as well. So um, I, I'm not going to present a lot of research, but I, I do want to just make reference to one of the better studies by, this is Dennis McCarty actually did more of a meta-analysis of the, the studies that have been developed to kind of look at where we were with our, our um, inclusion of, of intensive outpatient treatment into our continuum. And um, this was published in 2014, but looked at how things looked in 2011. And at that time, uh, there were uh, 6,089 programs in the United States that reported offering IOP services, which, which was a little less than 50% of all the addiction treatment programs at that time, having served uh, uh, close to 150,000 patients, which was about 12% of those receiving addiction treatment. I would say if this were to be updated, I did not have an update st updated statistic to show you. I would, I, would, I would venture to guess just by the response to this session that there are a lot more uh, programs um, uh, offering this service than, uh, than were um, about 10 years ago. Um, if, uh, if I could just kind of overview in, in those, in, 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 in uh, Dr. McCarty's uh, uh, research, he looked particularly at 10, 10 individual studies that looked at the efficacy of IoT and based on the quality of the trials, the diversity of the setting and the consistency of outcomes, the level of evidence for intensive outpatient treatment was in fact rated high. Uh, and that was due to the fact that there was a uh, consistent reduction in alcohol and drug use and problem severity, as well as increases in days abstinent for those individuals participating in IOP. Um, that, of course, was uh, the outcomes are really comparable to inpatient outcomes. I'm not saying that, that uh, one replaces the other. I'm just making the point that uh, there were certainly some variations with severity levels, but for generally speaking, um, outpatients were equally favorable uh, in, the, in, uh, in the intermediate level of care compared to the inpatient level of care. That said, uh, if you've seen one IOP program, you've seen one IOP program. Uh, as someone who's been around the country and perhaps visited some of your programs, uh, I can tell you that uh, it's, it's been very unusual that I've, I've seen um, a high degree of standardization across the system of care. And I hope this talk actually promotes that as an opportunity because I, I do think that uh, with further standardization, I, I think we can probably be more likely to consistently deliver best practices as a field within uh, this level of care. Now, um, there are some, uh, there were then, and there still are some unknowns about this level of care. Uh, one of which is, is it's not always that clear. I mean, ASAM certainly guides this, but not always predictable as to who, who might first need or benefit from inpatient or residential care versus IOT. So this is really a case-by-case -case decision. And as I say, ASAM offers a real guidepost for how we make those placement uh, determinations. We also don't um, really have a clear idea about what type, duration, or intensity of service. We're generally modeled around the service definition of somewhere around nine hours per week. But the truth is there's just like um, we can't say uh, conclusively that 28 days or 30 days of inpatient treatment, you know, necessarily predictably leads to better outcomes than 31 days or 45 days or 60 days. We do know that duration of stay certainly informs outcome. And so as one of the things we're going to be emphasizing is that IOT should not be considered uh, an episode of care, but simply just part of the continuum in which uh, people continue care uh, hopefully for a, a long enough duration of time to, uh, uh, to um, uh, uh, achieve and get established in, in sustainable recovery. We also don't know the impact of specific services. I mean, we have a general idea that, that, that 
more is uh, that uh, some is better than none, and more is better than 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 uh, than some. Um, but we can't specifically say you, you know individual counseling is going to improve your outcomes. If you add individual counseling, you're going to improve your outcomes by 50% or something like that. Uh, but generally, we do see that more services tend to tend to uh, promote better outcomes. And we also don't know right now the optimal level and duration of step-down services which sustain the IOP effect. Although again, from, from the literature, we know that people who are, who are connected to, to a recovery resource that they actively engage and make good use of for at least 12 months tend to have better outcomes than those who are engaged for lesser periods of time. So let's talk about what is this uh, intermediate level of care known as intensive outpatient treatment. So I don't know if, um, I, I may date myself here a bit, but the reality is I've been in the addictions treatment field for close to 40 years. And when I came into the field, it looked something like this, which was that we would serve people in either a traditional episode, what we call episodic outpatient level of care, inpatient for more acute care management. And then we actually did have a, a, a fair number of residential services that operated within, um, in our, within our industry. That said, I will tell you as a clinician back then, my experience was that sometimes I felt, because I worked in both outpatient, inpatient, and residential, that sometimes I felt like, uh, man, it would really be good if, um, for somebody in outpatient, if we had a little bit more structure, a little bit more opportunity to see people more often, or uh, have a fuller range of services that might address their, their comprehensive needs. But they didn't quite meet, meet, meet criteria to justify perhaps a referral to an inpatient or residential level of care. And the same was true on the other side, that we had people served on the inpatient or residential side that might have been you know, adequately stabilized and motivated and resourced that they could have benefited from a lower lesser, lesser of care had we had it, but to go from inpatient just to outpatient um, didn't seem like that would be enough. And so one thing intensive outpatient treatment has, has really done is it's helped us fill that gap within the continuum so that now we do have, in fact, a fuller continuum and a broader range of services that can be more tailored to what people need, when they need it, and as much as they need it. Um, intensive outpatient treatment has also been, because I've, I've been, in the, as I say, in the field quite some time, it's, it's actually been something that has been responsive to the changes in population and, and within the industry. For example, currently, um, I don't know, you know, for those of you participating, I, 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 you know, we're all in different places today, but I, I know in, in my state in North Carolina, there's a, a pretty intense movement toward what we call value-based and whole person care, where now uh, those of us who provide um, counseling um, and me mental health uh, counseling and, and treatment services um, are responsible for ensuring people's um, uh, healthcare needs and um, their their social determinants and things of that nature. Uh, the other thing is, over the years, of course, you know, you think about uh, you, you know the methamphetamine issue and the cocaine issue and now the opioid issue and all the other issues never went away, by the way. But uh, you, you know the the acuity and complexity of the of the of the individuals we serve seems to I think most of us would agree seems to be more challenging. And uh, intensive outpatient treatment has done a really good job queuing up to be responsive to those needs uh, and has been nimble and flexible enough to, to do that. And that will be clearer as I talk further about how and, how and why it works. Um, it's also intended as an intermediate level of care to be more flexible. This is a key word. Um, in, in other words, uh, you know, even though I'm gonna also promote the idea of standard, standard approaches, um, every individual still needs a treatment plan tailored to his or her needs. And what's really nice about intensive outpatient is you can almost plan day to day, week to week as to how intensive a, a service do people really need. And it's really not intended to be a fixed level of care like perhaps the old 28 day models. It's intended to be much more flexible so that as I say, people are, 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 um, uh, are served uh, in varying ways at varying times depending on what they need. So for example, they may start an intensive outpatient treatment and then you know in some cases, demonstrate that they're ready for outpatient. Other times they might need a, a short inpatient stay and then they step back down to, to intensive outpatient for, for whatever duration of time. So, so, so the idea of being more flexible uh, is, is really what's intended. And ideally what we see um, is that we, we are able in this level of care to provide really more services at less cost for a longer period of time. And this is one of its, one of its benefits. 
And one reason why it was, it was adopted by, manage, uh, by insurance companies and managed care companies in particular is that it was a great way to actually uh, serve people with high needs with, uh, with lesser cost and, and really to do it in a way where we had a longer period of time to work with people. And then the other aspect of, of IoT is hopefully this is across the continuum is that there's a commitment to using evidence-based practices. Uh, and as I just mentioned, it's, it's intended to be need-based, adaptive, and comprehensive in, in nature, and uh, very uh, intentionally uh, was developed with an incorporation of NIDA's principles of effective treatment. Uh, I'm going to guess that many of you are familiar with uh, what was first published in 1999, as was updated, uh, I think, about 10, 10 years or so later. Uh, principles that are best based on um, based on the research uh, about about uh, what is effective treatment, how to ensure it. Um, I'm not going to review all the principles. I'm going to guess most of you are familiar, but you see uh, these are the first seven right here. You probably it's all common sense. We all know that now. But uh, um, intensive outpatient treatment. If you're a, a provider, you want to be thinking about how you match up to these uh, 13 core principles of uh, of effective treatment. Um, and, and not to say that intensive outpatient treatment is in, going to be all things to all people, but uh, it can pretty reliably incorporate all of these particular principles into its model. <clears throat> okay, I, I'm going to, this is kind of back to basics here. What are we treating? So let me just remind us for the, for the uh, uh, benefit of our conversation here that our, uh, our uh, target of, of uh, our, our, our target of uh, treatment is is uh, substance use disorders, uh, known refer, referred here as addiction, and ACM uh, defined this pretty uh, in a way that I think has been uniformly affected by the field by um, by the following, describing it as a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. Dysfunction in these circuits leads to characteristic biological, psychological, social, and spiritual manifestations. This is reflected in an individual pathologically pursuing reward and or relief by substance use and other behaviors. One reason I remind us of this, and this is what makes it relevant to intensive outpatient treatment, is that uh, Nora Valkow, the, the um, director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, uh, I've heard her lecture a number of times, and, and I once heard her really boil it down to uh, several simple things that really resonated with me anyway in terms of how we think about what we try to do an intensive outpatient treatment when, when she said that the science of addiction and recovery should inform treatment in the following ways. Uh, point one was that, as we know, substance use is powerfully reinforcing and results in decreased in, in, inhibitory control and reasoning ability. Well, one of the hallmarks of IOP is that it provides structure, oversight, reinforcement, and shapes new learning, which uh, directly addresses that particular deficit. The other thing, uh, I've had the benefit to interact with a lot of the, you know, uh, neuro, premier neuroscientists in this field over the years, and, and I, I usually ask them, you know, if you could get, give me a sense of, uh, you, you know, at least your opinion about what more than anything activates the craving state in the addicted brain, the, the, the common answer I get is, is stress, and, and that's been demonstrated through, you know, through all those imaging studies many of us have seen now. And so because of that, you know, we, we, we know that uh, we have to think about how we address the issue of stress in clinical practice. And intensive outpatient pro and treatment, one of the things we're trying to do is actively work to reduce an individual's personal stressors in life. Now that's not to say, and I tell people this all the time, you know, we're not gonna eliminate stress out of your life. Stress is a, is a part of life. Look what we're going through right now. That said, what we will do is certainly where we can reduce those stressors by not, have, not helping you not have to worry about whether you're going to put food on the table tonight. You know, we can help in those kinds of ways. We could also help, help uh, in giving you the capacity to uh, have general coping and lifestyle, and I'm sorry, in general life skills that's going to better enable you to actually manage and live with the stress that you have. An intensive outpatient program is very targeted to that particular objective. And then the third point that Dr. Volkow uh, emphasizes is that time itself is a healer. Connection, as well as a better life, is what really ultimately leads to sustainable recovery. And like you know, other forms of, of treatment, uh, particularly in the higher ends of the continuum, 
we know that the community of care itself serves as the agent of change. And in intensive outpatient treatment, what we're trying to do is, is really organize and facilitate uh, what SAMHSA refers to as a recovery-oriented system of care that promotes a life that is worth it in recovery. And I want to emphasize this worth it issue for a minute. Let me just give you a quick vignette. So years ago, I worked in a detox center, and I um, recall that uh, it was very common that you know, on day three, four, or five, uh, when people were reasonably well stabilized, uh, you know, we would start preparing people for that next step into their recovery. And the, 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 when I asked people, like, how are you doing? Like, are you, are you motivated for that, taking that next step? Are you ready for this? Uh, do you feel confident you're going to be successful? Oftentimes, the question I got or the response I got was, well, you know, I'm feeling a little bit better. Yeah, I'm clearer of mind and body and, and healthier of body. But, you know, I'm just realizing I got no place to live. I got uh, no job. I got no job skills. I got criminal charges. I got no money in the bank and everybody hates me. You woke me up for this. <laughs> in other words, unfortunately, um, detox doesn't, th th doesn't necessarily lead to a better life. If anything, for a lot of the people we work with, you know, life is, is worse in early recovery, not better. Uh, because you've given up the one thing that's mediated that stress. And the other thing is, you, you know, you don't have what you need to get along in life. So this basically leads to this point, which is an intensive outpatient treatment. The, the things that we try to target are the three keys to recovery. First being capacity. You, you've got to, you know, you've, you, 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 you've got to not have to be distracted by, you know, by hunger and, and, uh, and housing and, you know, and, 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 and whether or not you're employable and things of that nature is that you've got to be supported in the ways that are going to allow you to get from a Monday to a Tuesday without having to worry about your life falling apart. And again, intensive outpatient treatment is not going to necessarily meet all those needs, but it should be at least linked to a system of care that does. Uh, the other part of capacity is giving people, as I mentioned earlier, the individual capacities through skills and, and supports to be able to effectively manage their lives in, uh, in and through early recovery. And then this thing about connection, I can't emphasize enough. One of the real benefits of this model is it's very group-based. Um, and so uh, people draw so much on the, on the investment. That, for example, this morning, I facilitated a group. I was, I was mentioning this to Glenn and David earlier. And uh, one of the takeaways, it was just great when I you know, was checking in with everybody. I'm getting notes as my interconnection is unstable. So I, I hope that you guys can help me there if, if, I, if I get lost here. Um, is that um, uh, one person's comment was, you know, I realize that as long as we're staying connected and that we're together in this, uh, that I'm much more hopeful that, that we're all going to get through it. You, you know, just that bond that people had with each other, you know, was really what gave them a sense of confidence and, and, uh, and, and hope. And that's the beauty of, uh, of what you see in, a, in a, um, a therapy model like this. The other is, is capital, recovery capital. Um, I know that word is now in our industry. It deserves to be because it makes all the difference. In other words, when life becomes worth it. And so what does that mean? Well, one, it means it's worth it because I feel cared for by other people, you know, through the therapy staff and through the relationships I have with my co-participants. But recovery capital is also, life is just better now. You know, the fact that I wake up every day and, and I don't have to worry about what I did the night before, or, you know, um, I'm getting my family's trust back again. I, I heard a client recently say, it feels so good to go to my mother's house now and she doesn't lock up her pocketbook, you know, that I'm getting trust back, or I'm, I'm getting, gaining a greater sense of responsibility or a greater sense and clarity of what I want out of life or that I deserve a better life. You know, when you hear people make comments like that, you can always feel hopeful that the recovery is proving itself to be valuable and worth it. And in intensive outpatient treatment, this is one of the keys. I, I know for myself, and I kind of encourage this with people I, 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 uh, I supervise, is it's a useful question to ask people on the front end, you know, if you're to stick this thing out, what, what's gonna make it worth it? At the end of your treatment participation, what's gonna tell you that all this was worth it? And recently uh, I, I asked somebody that question and the answer was, couldn't have been any clearer. If I know I can get my kids back. Well, gosh, now we know. And that's what we're gonna help you, uh, help you achieve. Okay, um, 
so let's talk about some advantages as well as I'll be an equal opportunity broker of communication here. Um, some advantages and disadvantages of intensive outpatient treatment. One advantage is that, well, I want to be clear, it doesn't serve all people, uh, it's, it's not all things to all people. It does in fact serve a broad range of populations uh, with varying acuity levels. Now, in the early days of IOP, some of us on this call might remember, this model was developed primarily to serve those individuals who were employed uh, so that they didn't have to leave their jobs to go off to inpatient treatment or deal with the stigma of that and so on. And, you know, I, I remember we were challenged a bit when we started to, uh, because of managed care, you know, restrictions on inpatient admissions and so on and so forth, you know, related particularly to people with cocaine addictions and some other things, that we, we couldn't always even access inpatient treatment. We had to figure out how could we serve or could we serve individuals who had more severe dependencies on, on you know, on, on more addictive substances like methamphetamine and cocaine? Well, thanks to UCLA and the work they did in developing Matrix, which is an intensive outpatient model that uh, has, has been well supported um, uh, in the science community, um, we, we demonstrated through Matrix, and certainly I can tell you uh, experiences all around the country, that in fact, IOP is up for the job that while, again, it's not gonna be all things to all people, it, it can handle as long as, you know, and I'll talk later about people uh, who are a good fit, as long as people are a good fit in the way in which we'll talk about, uh, IOP can, can do the job. It's also very efficient and flexible. As I say, uh, it, it's a great way to streamline services and to meet people where they are when they're there, as opposed to um, at some other point in time. Um, and I do realize that there are some states that have service definitions that in some ways interfere with this flexibility um, intention through mandates of it has to be this way, that way, you know, like in other words, it's, you know, nine hours, three days a week, no, no, and it can't be two days more in a row and three hours each day and so on and so forth. I will tell you in some ways that's not what, from what I understand, what this model intended. It really was intended to be much more flexible in terms of how you would, uh, you would engage people. So uh, we were not trying to replicate the 28-day model on an outpatient basis. So that's an important point to, to note. It's also another advantage is it does provide clinical continuity for those people who need step up and step down. That intermediate uh, um, uh, fill in the gap perspective I mentioned earlier. The other, and maybe you have to live this to know it, but it is a really fun way of working with people and consumer friendly insofar as we work real hard to make sure people don't have to give up their jobs and give up the things in normal life that, you know, that make life worth living. Um, and so uh, usually it's an easier kind of treatment to access. People who might be a little guarded or unwilling to engage in treatment might be more apt to do, particularly if it's like a, you know, residential option where they have to go away and explain themselves and so on and so forth. It, sometimes it's an easier sell to say, look, you don't have to give up any of your, you know, of, of your, life circumstances other than the high risk ones. Um, we want you to continue to, you know, uh, maintain connection to your family and to your job and the things that uh, give you meaning and purpose and, and, and so on. And uh, um, as, you know, Dennis McCarty pointed out in his 2014 study, it is a model of treatment that does in fact work in terms of the usual metrics for how we determine whether or not treatment is effective. That said, that said, there are some challenges with, with intensive outpatient treatment. One is the reality is people uh, are only in the program for the hours of the day. They're in the program for whatever days of the week they're in the program. So uh, that means uh, most of their life, they're still in their community and they're still gonna be exposed to day-to-day -day risks and challenges to their recovery. And in this discussion, we'll talk about how to uh, identify and manage those. Uh, also, All right, guys. There you are. Hey, Paul, do you mind uh, repeating that? It broke up for just a second there, man. Oh, gosh. What, what part? Challenges of intensive outpatient treatment? Yep. Just for a, It was only for about uh, 10 seconds. Not okay. So I think I was on engagement and adherence, and it's a challenge for the obvious reasons. People have to show up on their own. No one's going to get them out of bed to say it's group time. So um, that's just a, it's an obvious issue. You have to work hard to engage people. I'll talk about some strategies for that later. 
because uh, folks oftentimes like to keep their options open or just, hey, it's a rainy day, I don't feel like coming, or hey, you know, I, I, I'm, uh, I, I passed the bar on the, on the way to the treatment program, and right now um, my recovery is not solid enough to allow me to make one choice over the other. The other thing is uh, it doesn't provide the kind of relief for the client or his family as sometimes going away might. Uh, I've heard, I've been with family sometimes when I've recommended an IOP placement and the response is, you mean he's not gonna go away anywhere? He's gonna still be living at home? They're not always crazy about that idea. So uh, yeah, uh, it, it's a, it can be an issue for people and it's to all grist for the mill. Um, to be honest, even though we try to make it convenient for clients, if you were to tell me, I'm, I've got somebody who's got high cholesterol, and I'll out myself that way. And if you were to tell me that the most promising way of reducing my cholesterol level is if I were to commit for 12 weeks to a program that uh, on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursdays, Thursday evenings uh, would have group-based services from 6 at night to 9 o'clock at night, uh, and if I attended those groups faithfully and participated and also took my medication and made those lifestyle changes that I need to make to lower my cholesterol, that uh, if I did this IOP level of care, my cholesterol would be down 100 points in 12 weeks. Well, you know, uh, knowing my life and my schedule and everything else, I'd probably say I might just take my chances. So in other words, let's be honest. It, it's, we're asking people to do a lot when we're asking them to come into our program, and we should appreciate that. Um, so it's not convenient for them. It can also not be so convenient for the staff because you've got a staff, you, you know, an IOP on the days it's supposed to be held and be available to people, as I'll be talking about, 24-7. Uh, and, you know, when do our clients tend to have challenges? Is it during program hours? No, it's usually on the weekends and so on and so forth. So if at the end of a group night, I've had this happen. Um, and uh, I remember what I, I was into, it was a Tuesday night, I, and I started getting hooked on one of these shows that you you know, that, that you're easy to binge on. And I was looking forward to kind of get my, you know, getting the group finished and getting my notes done and getting home in time to, to watch my favorite show. Didn't have DVR back then. And uh, anyway, this person started talking about, you know, you know, whether or not they, uh, they, they might want to live for another day. And so you kind of can't say, hold that suicidal thought. Yeah, I've got a show I want to watch tonight. We'll see tomorrow for group. It doesn't work that way. You're going to have to deal with it, you know, in the here and now. And the truth is those kinds of issues come up day to day. Um, and so I'm gonna be honest and tell you the, the staff can easily burn out when you have a particularly uh, 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 a pretty uh, um, high, high need caseload and a lot of us do. So I told you I'd, I'd, be, I'd be fair and balanced in this perspective. Um, some of those clinical realities, just to spell it out in the ways in which, again, I, I'm sure you appreciate, we're dealing oftentimes, probably more usually than not, with a range of anxiety and affective disorders, personality disorders, uh, post-traumatic stress disorders, more and more common, uh, infectious diseases, poverty, unemployment, legal issues, homelessness, and high-risk housing. So while the model may have been established at one point for people who are maybe a, a little bit more functional and less needy, the reality is we've had to learn to stretch and be more responsive to more people with greater need. And I'm glad to say we've learned how to do that. One way we think about how to approach those challenges is to reflect on uh, the, uh, this is the famous egg slide that NIDA produced some years ago through the Research Triangle Institute called uh, Drug Abuse uh, Treatment Components and Comprehensive Services. And you can see by, you know, looking at the slide here that, um, uh, IOP is, is very much oriented to what you see here, which is you've got traditional core services, you know, all the things mentioned there, abstinence-based, pharmacotherapy, group individual counseling. I'll get into these more individually. And then you've got all these wraparound supports that are going to be targeted for people with those individual needs. And as I say, IOP doesn't have to be all things to all people, but it should be linked to all of those things that people might otherwise need if, in fact, you're trying to to serve people in the community. Now, um, I, I want to kind of reflect on the fact that many of us work in, in a managed care environment. And um, I, I kind of see this as really a good fit for managed care. I, I, as I say, I, th I think we've demonstrated cost containment and uh, clinical efficacy at the same time. Um, and so we have best practices and we have worst practices that can also be identified. So the best practices, of course, are when we have the flexibility of 
keeping people in treatment based on their individual needs and progress. So if it's like, well, they've already had their 12 weeks of IOP, so they should be done, that, that is not best practice. So what's nice about this model is uh, ideally you've got, you know, you've got metrics, outcome-driven metrics that tell you wh what, um, you know, what level of care people really need. In other words, you can, you can, you, you, you can flex down the intensity. Uh, I'll say more about that later, but just to give you the idea that it could be over a course of, you know, most days of the week down to like, you know, our program, for example, was five days a week. And then as you progress, according to those metrics, you go to four, then to three, then to two, and then to one for, you know, for an indefinite period of time. And, and that, you know, that motivated people and that also enabled us too when people had, you know, had scaled down, if they had a, you know, maybe a, you know, relapse or a stress event happen, we could re-engage people, you know, back into the higher level of care for maybe a week or two, give them a booster or support until they were ready to go back to where they were. So it's really intended to be that kind of like an accordion, really that flexible in how we serve people. Um, and the, the key is though, you've got to have that criteria. You can't just say, well, we think he's doing better or he's participating more. What, what does that mean? You know, you really have to be, and we should be accountable to demonstrating whether or not people are benefiting from our service through clinical, uh, through cl specific clinical indicators that, that demonstrate that success. And I'll give you some of those later in the, in the talk. Um, also, we should be paid to do outreach and engagement with people um, because uh, I, intensive outpatient treatment, really treatment of any kind is not a field of dreams. You build it and they come. That's not how it works in our business. We have to work really, really hard to engage people. You all probably know that statistic that says, uh, SAMHSA puts it out every year the percentage of people who are treatment needy versus treatment ready, and um, the percentage of people who are uh, uh, needy but not yet ready is um, most years, 95, at least last year, 95.5%. So we have our work cut out for us to, to, uh, to engage people. And that really is more of a process than an event. Um, and so I, I, it is a service that ideally you're getting paid for because if you're gonna keep people out of high cost centers, uh, you need to be supported in how you deal with people who are, you know, um, uh, who are needy but not yet ready if we're trying to engage them into treatment. And then there's the whole engagement of family and community supports. A central tenet of this model is things work best to the extent to which other people in the person's life and community are there to support their efforts. Um, and and uh, I'll talk more about that later as well. And then also thinking about IOT as an integrated, multidisciplinary, comprehensive, and long-term way of working with people, uh, um, a la the NIDA uh, principles of effective treatment. And then we have the worst practices, and and uh, I, I, you know, I wish we didn't have to have this conversation, but the reality is, is uh, I, I still experience this, uh, and here are others who do as well, is that uh, it's hard to sometimes um, get an authorization for an, an admission to uh, and, I, uh, and IOP until people fail first and outpatient. And uh, I think most of us on this call would agree that that, that definitely is the worst practice. I, I, you know, I thank goodness that uh, uh, we don't treat heart disease that way. So, uh, it, you know, it, it, there's certainly room for improvement. That said, we should also be prepared to make the case and ASAM offers us that, those guidelines for why we think somebody needs IOP versus outpatient. And then restrictions on readmission. You know, you get two admissions to IOP a year. Well, again, if we treated diabetes and, and uh, other chronic diseases that way, I, I, don't, I really don't know what kind of outcomes we could expect. Um, and so, um, you, you know, I, I'm a big believer in, in things like uh, um, uh, having uh, an opportunity to, to, uh, to have case rates uh, so that there's maybe even some shared risk so that uh, we can make the case that uh, we're going to be invested in best practice and not keeping people, giving people more than what they need. In my experience, um, people usually don't want more treatment than they, than they need. Typically, they want less, not more. So uh, I, it would be nice if we got a little bit more grace in that regard, but, but I do understand that we need to uh, make our case uh, in clinical terms. Um, and then authorizations and payments uh, that are based more on how long have they been there? Okay, well, they've already had their, you know, four or five weeks, or they've had two weeks abstinence, so it's time for them to step down to 12-step meetings, um, uh, despite the fact that, you know, there are also lots of indicators that suggest that they're really not yet stable or fully resourced to sustain that recovery. 
Uh, it's also a worse practice when everyone has the exact same treatment plan. As I say, we should standardize things to some extent, but everyone's different and everyone needs an individualized plan according to their individual needs. Um, and then, of course, expecting quick, linear, and sustainable results uh, without having um, the capacity to apply those best practices. So I'm hoping this is making sense. Unfortunately, this is a format where I can't get feedback to make sure you're, you know it is, but uh, I'm going to carry on assuming such, and I'll trust Glenn if I have to get redirected in some way. He'll, he'll be good about doing that. So let's talk about um, some other issues related to, you know, as we describe what it is a little bit more, we're kind of approaching the how and why it works. Uh, staffing and intensive outpatient treatment, as I mentioned earlier, should be multidisciplinary. So you do need a quality administrator who understands the business of the business, but also is sensitive to the clinical demands of that business. I'll say more about that later. Um, ideally, a medical director prescriber who uh, is a part of the team and can meet regularly with the team. That being said, the reality is sometimes that might be a contract person, but it I, uh, would um, hopefully be a contract person who understands the work you're doing and is a good communicator and is receptive to uh, feedback from the staff about um, about the uh, about the uh, medical care needs of that uh, of the individual clients. Uh, of course, it always helps to have a clinical coordinator. I've been blessed to work with a, a number over the years that because uh, I've been administrator and clinical coordinator, but I can tell you as the administrator, it's wonderful when you have a clinical coordinator who you can just trust has the, you know, ha has everything in order day to day and manages the staff and all the services and, you know, deals with how we're going to get organized around uh, um, doing groups during a, you know, a pandemic. <laughs> so uh, you got to have a good co uh, clinical coordinator running things. And then of course you need skilled and, and experienced counselors. And I do want to add, these should be folks that are trained or getting good training in group and family therapy as well as uh, individual therapy because the, uh, group and family therapy tend to be core services. And, and um, they, they are specialized, uh, they are specialized skills and, and we want people to be trained in those. More and more our field is uh, incorporating peer support specialists and I can tell you they have been so valuable in my experience uh, in a lot of different ways and so I, uh, I would hope that uh, folks would see those as a, as, as a regular um, member of a, of a quality team. And then volunteers, uh, it, you know, if you can have people in the community who support you by coming in, for example, and, and teaching how uh, finance management skills or uh, uh, providing, uh, you know, kind of legal assistance to people with legal problems and, and uh, things of that nature. You know, we, ha having connections to the community like that can be very, very valuable. Uh, of course, you have to be HIPAA compliant and all that kind of thing, but, but, but thinking about the broader community is one of your opportunities in IoT, is to not just think about this as, a, as an insular program that's isolated from the rest of the world. It, it ideally would be integrated with the world in a, in a meaningful way that, that uh, um, can be supported by the resources within that world. Okay, I'm gonna review some basic tenets of intensive outpatient treatment. Um, first being space, environment, and relationship, and relationships matter. Um, and let me elaborate on space. So uh, in, in a, some years ago, I used to be a CARF surveyor. There may be people on the call who've been CARF surveyed or are surveyors themselves. And, and, and uh, I, I know one of the ways I approached my survey was I would um, do a little focus group with clients and I would ask them questions about, tell me about your experience in this program. How do you feel treated and supported? And, you know, and usually the feedback was usually pretty good. But I, then I would say, is there's one thing I could, if there's anything I can suggest to, to people in this program, you know, ways they can make your experience better, what, that, what, what would that be? And it's interesting, the kind of answer I would commonly get was uh, something like, uh, you know, it'd be great if they take that dead plant that's been sitting in the lobby for three years, you know, and, and put in a fresh one. Or it'd be nice if the coffee pot actually had coffee and it wasn't all grimy and burned. Or, you know, if they could put some posters or some prints on the wall so we weren't just looking at cinder block. You know, and believe it or not, people pay attention to these kinds of things. And so, you know, giving people, not to say we're all, you know, going to be resourced so that we can treat people in these, you know, in, in, uh, uh, four, uh, in, 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 in four diamond environments, but if we can at least give people a better experience so that they feel treated with care and, and concern and dignity, that, that really helps. And then the whole idea of relationships matter. They, you know, they matter from beginning, middle, and end in terms of if you think about, you know, um, who's the person on the phone that takes that first phone call? 
who's going to greet them at the door? Do you have security? Do they, you know, um, that, that mind the, the program? Are they versed in the services you provide? Are they part of the treatment team? I mean, um, it's just amazing how much, um, uh, how much benefit a program and our clients can have when everybody in the program, you, you know, records clerks, whoever, you know, that is a part of that treatment experience. Um, so there's staff relationships and of course the relationships they have with their, uh, with their co-participants. And then the idea of uh, incorporating collaborative strategies for, uh, for getting client and family buy-in and working with stakeholders. In other words, uh, as we think about treatment planning, the, the more and more we actually get everybody's input, the better this goes. And then applying integrated empirically supported approaches, facilitating development of recovery or system of care. And then as I mentioned, having flexible uh, uh, duration and intensity with specific guidelines to determine how you move people uh, back and forth or uh, and through the IOP. Uh, the how and why it works is you're hopefully getting the idea. It's a, it, it's a safe place. It's a place where people can feel cared for, supported, and safe. It offers a community. It provides understanding and hope uh, and understanding that, you know, uh, of their disease, we, you know, and, and more literacy in that regard, as well as a, a sense that, that life can be better um, uh, it, and, and uh, through, uh, through an experience of recovery. A sense of empowerment that they are feeling like they've got what it takes to be successful. And then one phrase we oftentimes use to describe uh, IOT, it's a learning laboratory. It's a way in which this is really one of the great benefits of it is, is you know, people can leave group um, having learned a new skill, uh, you know, how to be wise mind tonight, you know, versus addicted mind in my approach to how I have this conversation with this person who drives me crazy at work. Um, and so, uh, you know, you're giving people in real time, real, you know, concrete responses to, to life situations. And it's not a matter of then learning, you know, instead of learning this in isolated settings and then, then you know, go out and apply it when you're finished. You're applying your new skills in vivo, which makes it probably more likely that you're going to establish uh, true change and become more confident in, in being able to follow through with those skills. The other benefit is you're also able to, uh, in an ongoing way, monitor, assess, and support people so that you know, again, in real time, how is this person really doing um, in their recovery? I, I hear what they're saying, but now we can really more accurately monitor, not just through urine tests, but we, you know, we're laying our eyes on people. We're collecting collateral information from their family and others who actually interact with them and can give us feedback on, you know, how they're managing their lives and their recovery. So uh, kind of is further way of saying the same thing, but structure, accountability, and lots of love. Focusing on the recovery of both, both the prefrontal and the limbic systems. The prefrontal system, of course, is the thinking brain, the part that needs help in terms of being able to, you know, use better judgment, make decisions, better decisions, and, and, and uh, develop uh, uh, how do you think through things and play the tape and know what, you know, and, and do a chain analysis and so on and so forth so that you're using that part of your brain to establish and sustain your recovery. And then of course the limbic brain, which is how do you stabilize the emotional system through coping, through love, you know, through, through uh, 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 feeling connected to your values and to the, the people that matter to you. It offers uh, also competing reinforcers. In other words, drug use, as we know, you know, the drug itself is a powerful reinforcer for people, which is why they go back to it. So what we're doing instead is you know, as people, you know, day by day report on, you know what, this is another day that I haven't used, and they get all that validation from the group and all that support, um, I can tell you that that's what carries people into the next day. Um, and uh, it's an important part of how and why this works. It also validates and normalizes the struggle. People don't feel alone and isolated, and they can appreciate that, that um, uh, you know, what they're going through is what, the, is what they should be going through and, and it allows them to become more patient and hopeful. Also, it's a model that's consistent with the way we've always practiced in this field, which is we keep it simple, just one day at a time. And at the same time, we plan for the long term. So the features of IoT, therapeutic structured accountability. Uh, typically, uh, the contact hours are somewhere between six and nine. I, I do know service definitions usually like nine. Now, there are different ways we could talk about how you structure that to add up to nine, you know, because ideally you're also doing unbundled services like family counseling and individual counseling and so on. 
but um, it, it's structured over, you know, at least a period of, of a number of hours. And the six to nine is there to suggest that, again, you can scale up and skip, scale down within a flexible model. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you before this talks over kind of an example of what that looks like. Uh, it can be provided, you could do it in a homeless shelter, you could do it in a hospital setting, you could do it in a jail-based setting. Um, you know, where you do it doesn't matter as much as what you're doing where you're there. Um, and then there is a range of therapeutic approaches and services that I mentioned the team composite earlier. What it's not, I want to make sure that we also understand it, it, it's not some things. It's not acute care. If people need acute care, that's what they should get. Uh, it is not an alternative to that point to inpatient treatment. There, there are obviously people who really uh, need and would better benefit from inpatient treatment. As I say, the ASAM guidelines help us make those determinations. Uh, I've emphasized throughout this talk, it's not all things to all people. It is not cheap to provide or receive. I am saying it is cost effective, but uh, it, it still costs money. If you want to have good staff, compensate them well, um, and uh, be able to provide these services and have vouchers so that people can, uh, can get to your program and actually have money so that you can take people bowling and things that we could talk further about, you're going to have to have some money to do that. And so um, this is where the business of the business is. You have to negotiate good rates for your IOP coverage um, and ensure that uh, um, you're, you know, you're resourced and budgeted accordingly. Um, it's also not, I mentioned this earlier, easy to provide the service or easy to receive. So just to be clear. Um, so in the um, SAMHSA tips, there's a lot of emphasis on how research has informed the practice of intensive outpatient treatment. And um, uh, there are very simple things that we, that we identify in those tips that I'll just quickly review without really elaborating, because I, I, I know our time is going to be running short here soon. I want to make sure I get to some pra other practical things that might be useful to you. But it does help to ensure you have good referral networks. Once again, it's not a field of dreams. So um, I know in our IOP experience, it took a good couple years to really develop um, and, and uh, uh, reinforce those referral networks. So uh, once you get folks referring to you, you want to keep in communication with them, thank them for that referral, but also to whatever extent it's appropriate and they, they and their client are interested, keep them informed. I mean, if you can invite them to, for example, if you have a, some kind of transition event at the end and the person who referred them is an EAP counselor or probation officer, you know, if it's appropriate, invite that person to participate. I'll, I'll tell you, that really makes a difference. Lower the barriers to treatment, and uh, you all already know what those are. So and individually, you have to assess for your program what could get in the way of people getting here and, and being able and willing to, to continue to come once they do. There's no such thing as, as uh, you know, there's no wrong motivation for why people come. So people come, and you know, with the, uh, the, the usual st statement I hear is, I, I don't have a drug problem. I have a judge problem. <laughs> So uh, that's fine. Uh, you, you know, one of the things we've learned in motivational interviewing is, is uh, you know, what, what people want is not the problem. It's, it's the reasons that they, that they uh, pursue what they pursue that we're, we're trying to draw their attention to, toward uh, other ways of getting what they want. So if what they want is to get the judge off their back, we can help them with that. And uh, they may not be ready to buy into recovery, but we know they're ready to buy into getting the judge off their back. So let's work with that. And what we find is that, you know, it's all process. So uh, I just encourage people to, you know, put on your good act as if, as long as you're willing to come, you know, that's all we ask, even if you're not really committed, but if at least you're willing to kind of uh, sample the, this experience and be willing to adhere to its tenets. One tenet is for those people who are participating, one of the things we're, at least this has been our model, we, we, we want to, we do actually ask people to commit to is a willingness to not use substances or work toward not using substances for the duration of your time in here so that you can have that life experience. What you do with that after that, that's completely up to you. But this is what's at least going to enable you to at least know that, you know, to, to know what your choices are, should you uh, be in a position to make that choice and uh, hopefully equip you with um, the tools necessary if in fact you decide that you want to you want to continue to, uh, to, to maintain an abstinence-based recovery. So um, that, uh, that could be a whole lecture in and of itself, but I think you get the idea. And then partnership is key. I, I mentioned that earlier in terms of the relationships people need to establish. And of course, um, you know, not only is it not a field of, of dreams, but if people don't come, it just doesn't work. So anything you can do to keep people coming. And so this is where contingency management, for example, can help. Having you know, using, using um, 
vouchers and rewards and some of those methods of, of, uh, of uh, community reinforcement and so on can really make a difference for, 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 your, uh, for your retention. It also helps if you can provide transportation, particularly in certain situations. So um, focusing on how do you, because I'll tell you, the, the group gets watered down and, and just doesn't work when people don't come consistently. And then it becomes, well, he's not coming, but three days a week, why should I come, you know? And, and it's like, uh, it's really hard. So uh, I'll just give you a quick tip right now. I was going to get to it later, but, but one tip that I'll give you that really worked for us is if, uh, this is all part of our treatment agreement, is if you don't show up for a group on a given night without letting us know, um, we're, we're going to call you as a group. Uh, we've got a phone in the room and we're going to kind of all pick up the phone. And it's not a shame and blame and beat you up kind of thing. It's just a, it's an opportunity. Everybody gets on the phone and says, hey, you know, Glenn, where are you? We're missing you tonight. We're worried about you. And you got my number. If you want to reach out, you know, I'm here for you. So we got your chair empty. You know, we wish you were here with us and we hope we'll see you tomorrow and just know that uh, we're pulling for you. And I'll tell you what, uh, a lot of people don't like to get that call. <laughs> or get that message, they don't always answer the call, but uh, it does make a difference when, when you connect with people in, the, you know, in, in real time that way. Um, the other is a versus, hey, I'll see if they come back tomorrow, if not, I'll give them a call. Um, and also help make the participation worth it. Once again, it's like, you know, a question you might ask as you wrap up the day is, you know, what's worth it for you to you know, leave this room tonight and, and not use? You know, how, how has life been better to you, for you today to remain absent? And then as we've emphasized, time matters. You, you know, you don't do this thing very quickly. One size doesn't fit all. We've talked about that. Continually assess progress, adjust plan as needed, and involve families. Uh, medication assisted therapy, and that again would be an entire conversation if we talk more specifically about that as a topic. But you get the idea. It can improve outcomes when uh, it's targeted for particular needs. And then for the, those of you who are administrators on the line, you will appreciate that one research-based principle is You've got to manage your money, information, and resources. So who can be treated in an IOP? Um, it's intended for individuals with a moderate to severe substance use or co-occurring substance use and mental health disorder with people who, caveat of course, people who are not in need of medically supervised detox or 24-hour supervision, and they've got to meet that uh, the ASAM criteria. Um, this is not an ASAM lecture. Uh, you all are familiar, I'm sure, with the levels of care of ASAM and you see uh, intensive outpatient treatment and partial kind of in the same intermediate stage um, that uh, they're right there in the middle of the continuum. And you all are familiar, I'm sure, with the six dimensions of, uh, of ASAM and for IOP. Uh, number one, it needs to be a minimal risk of severe withdrawal. Uh, with number two, um, none are not too distracting by a medical risk. Cognitive, behavioral, emotional conditions, only mild severity. For readiness to change, as I mentioned, you're going to have variable degrees of, of readiness, but uh, uh, you have to demonstrate that uh, uh, with whatever level of readiness they need to have a structured program to both engage those folks and keep those people um, uh, supported. Uh, relapse and continued use, uh, if you know, their history will demonstrate their relapse risk without close monitoring and support. And then uh, their living environment, ideally, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, th their environment won't be too toxic. But typically, um, we see that uh, uh, in an unsupported environment, hopefully the patient has enough coping skills to be able to manage without having to go to residential, or they have an environment that's much more uh, personally conducive, um, particularly like through, a, you know, through a, a, a supervised living setting. So IOP is a great we have really good outcomes when we have people in halfway houses and Oxford houses in place like that. So it's, it's really good to actually have people some kind of recovery support housing while they're participating in IOP. So I mentioned earlier being willing, able, and ready. And, you know, your program model might be, ours was, is that for those people who said, look, I, you know, I, 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 I'm really not willing to commit, commit to this abstinence thing. I'm not even going to want to try it. Well, rather than say, we'll come back when, you, when, you, when, when, when you're ready, we'd rather say, well, we have a group instead that's, that's targeted for those of you who are needy but not yet ready and, you know, just at least give you some information about how alcohol and drugs affect brain, body, and behavior and help you assess your use in context of your values, your relationships, and the things that are important to you. And you, and you get to decide at the end of, you know, of maybe a few sessions. If you want to step into our IOP, you'll be more than welcome. If you want to say thanks, but no thanks, I've heard what you've had to say, 
that's okay too. You can always have the keys to the house come back anytime you want. Um, we also need to know though that the person is safe, stable, and living in, in some type of, as I mentioned earlier, conducive environment. Now, that's a relative thing, but I will tell you that um, I can think about it as one example, uh, a couple of occasions when I ask people, do you feel safe to be able to participate in this community-based program? We've had people actually say, you know what, I actually got somebody I owe money to and um, they, uh, you know, they, they're out looking for me. Um, I might be better off, you know, being served in some other community. I mean, these are real world issues that we have to kind of consider. Uh, also, are they, sa are they safe in terms of, you know, self-harm, harm from others and so on. And then um, are there needed community supports available? So if somebody's going to need um, uh, housing support or vocational support, are they going to have access to it when they're, intense, when they're in, the IO in the IOP? And then are there limited barriers to attendance that don't prohibit their participation um, in terms of, uh, you know, you think about cognitive capacities too. I mean, to be honest, I mean, you know, um, folks have to be stable enough to be cognitive, have the cognitive wherewithal to be able to benefit from the IOP. Uh, and then you've got those usual issues of transportation and childcare. Those are the common ones we hear about. Uh, that's that SAMHSA statistic I mentioned that uh, most people who need it don't want it. <laughs> Uh, sorry to say. So we've got our work cut out for us. Okay, so here's some questions you can consider as you reflect on, um, is our program accessible? Uh, where is it located? Is it on a bus line, for example? Are the hours going to allow for regular attendance? If I work in a community where there are three shifts, you know, where I've got a factory in my community where most people are employed, you know, am I providing two groups a day versus one so that people can, from the different, different shifts, can, can, uh, can participate? Uh, can transportation be provided? As I say, programs who do have better outcomes or better attendance, I should say. Uh, can we help with vouchers or connection? I will tell you at Duke years ago until risk management prohibited it, I hate to say, you know, we had that barrier. But we had a sorority at Duke who actually wanted to, to help us as a service project where they actually uh, sat with uh, the kids of our patients uh, while our, uh, the patients could participate in our, what we called our family care program for uh, the women who had young children. So, um, you, you know, you might think about how can we, you know, draw on the community to support us with this barrier. Uh, and also, can you be flexible in how you accommodate individual schedules? For example, I remember a case I had a fellow who, um, he, he really wanted to attend, but one of our commitments was a, a group on a Saturday morning for, you know, the, what we called our phase one. And, uh, and he just said, you know, look, um, my situation is that, the one thing in life I do that I'm really proud of is I attend my son's, uh, uh, my son's uh, little league baseball games consistently. I'm actually, I'm an assistant coach. It's the one thing I do in life that makes me feel, you know, like, like I, I'm, I'm a good person and a good dad. And, you know, I know our group meets, you know, every Saturday and whatnot, but it, you know, would it be okay if, you know, that I get a pass on that? And I can tell you, I, I remember when this happened because our group huddled up and our staff, I should say, and, and we started to debate, is it okay to make this exception and, and so on and so forth. And people were like, no, you know, if we do it for one, we have to do it all. Well, anyway, fortunately I was the, you know, I was the clinical coordinator. It was my client. So I got to make the call. Uh, but, you know, I think, you know, you got to make reasonable concessions in situations like this because they're, they're clinically appropriate. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's the way the program should work. Okay, so let's talk about engaging clients. Uh, it helps to build a relationship before they show up. And for those of us on the call, hopefully you've had motivational interviewing training and you know that that approach is really gonna get you the, you know, the most bang for your buck in terms of how you not talk somebody into treatment, but help them talk themselves into it by, uh, you know, so what were your reasons for calling? What would you like to get out of this? What are you envisioning? What would make it worth it? So on and so forth. And, and one of the things what we found in our program was we didn't get, you know, we had pretty low conversion rates from call to first intake appointment when we had the receptionist answer the phone and make the call um, because it wasn't much of a, a relational conversation. It was just more, you know, more about, you know, uh, setting up the appointment. And what we did is we, we started to have those calls start going to the staff on some kind of schedule rotation so that there was at least time to have more of a 10 to 15 minute more of a relationship building kind of approach to how we would um, schedule the, the intake uh, by, you know, talking about exploring whatever concerns, for example, the patient had. What was your expectation for coming? What, you know, what, 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 uh, 
uh, also assessing whether or not this was the right fit right now, because it, it might not be, particularly if somebody was in acute crisis. So we actually, our conversion rate really improved when we had the clinicians um, making those appointments directly. Um, and I know not everybody's resourced that way, but that did help. Also, you don't want to have people wait. So you really want to have, ideally, somebody answers that phone without having to go through, you know, a menu that has 50 inquiries. Um, and uh, I'll just tell you, it will make and break whether or not, because we have a lot of people, I mean, I'm one of these people, you know, I'll just hang up after the second one unless I'm really motivated to get to the end of it. So to be sensitive to how do you get, how do you get somebody to a live person very quickly and reliably. And then be clear about your screening and eligibility criteria so that you know you, that you, you, you make reasonably good decisions on the front end for who you at least accept for that first appointment because sometimes people, you know, you're gonna spend a whole day getting somebody inpatient when a couple of questions on the intake call could have diverted that um, ahead of time. And then you might, you know, the traditional appointment reminders through text or whatever, keeping it confidential, of course. We talked about welcoming environment, privacy, confidentiality, of course, is a must. Uh, timely admission, as I say, you know, if it's like, well, we've got a, somebody who can see you a week from Friday, that's not nearly as good as can you come in this afternoon. And then one of the things I've found is, um, is can you invite somebody to come with the client? So for example, um, I, I don't do it this way every time, but sometimes it depends on the situation. I might say, um, is, you know, before we, we schedule this appointment, do, do, you know, is there anybody that's in your life right now, it could be family, it could be friend, whoever, that, you know, care, might care about the fact that you and I are having a conversation today about your health, about your health and well-being. And you think they care enough about you that, that they might be willing just to maybe just to support you. They don't have to be in our, you know, in the session when we do the intake, but maybe just to come and, and just be with you as you go through this, because this can be a hard thing for, for people. And I'll tell you, uh, it's really helped sometimes when people have, you know, have, have brought somebody and they've been willing to do that. Uh, I'll give you a, a case in point. Um, I, I remember uh, a, a guy called, he was actually a Duke student, and, and I might surprise you to tell you we have Duke students who actually have alcohol and drug issues, but uh, believe it or not, some do. And uh, uh, usually when, when they came to our program, they came because the, you know, the, the dean would make the referral, and that's how they, you know, they came through that portal. But one time I was actually surprised this guy made his own referral to the program. And so I was curious, like what motivated your reason for calling and wanting this appointment? And he was real clear at his answer when he said, hold on to your seats now. He said, uh, well, the reason I'm, um, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to, to, uh, to treatment is because, uh, well, last Tuesday night, my fraternity, well, they did an intervention on me because they're, they're, they're concerned I'm drinking and drugging too much. And they told me I need help. And uh, uh, I have to tell you that uh, you don't need to ask too many diagnostic questions when t people tell you their fraternity is concerned. So anyway, so I asked this guy, I said, do you think any of them would be willing to come to you just to kind of support you in this program? And sure enough, not only did they come for this initial appointment, but they actually participated because his family actually lived in another state. They couldn't even participate uh, other than through, you know, virtual stuff. And uh, he actually uh, would actually uh, bring in some of his fraternity brother, brothers to participate in some of these sessions. So as much as you can, um, invite other people to come. How do we know when people are gonna succeed? Well, the obvious things, you know, how long are they getting, you know, time and treatment is the primary predictor of whether or not people get better. And anything less than 90 days, you're not gonna be confident in, in having much of an outcome. To what extent is there actual commitment to a better life, to re a life in recovery? What kind of relationships are people establishing with group members? Um, you wanna encourage an IOP that they really have a community within a community that they really support each other, even offline, but you also wanna monitor those relationships. And uh, is there regular attendance and completion and to what extent is the variety and range of services and, and as we talk about family and community involvement. Uh, the goals of intensive outpatient treatment, um, uh, very standard. I'm gonna start running through some of these slides. So if you want this handout, either Glenn or myself, be happy to, to get it to you because uh, I'm not gonna get to all the the pictures, but uh, all the slides, but uh, some of these, as I say, when I think that you pretty much know, I'm going to, I'm going to go through it. You probably know the usual goals are these things, no different than what we do in primary treatment and other places. And then the consensus panel um, uh, considered that when you think about what's the, what should be the core elements of an effective uh, IOT, they considered it in two ways. What should be the core services, the standard services, the ones that should exist for everybody all the time, and it was these 14 things. And then they also considered 
what are the, the optimal elements, the elements if your IOP were to be stronger and all that it could be, what could be some additional things and identify things like having alumni activities or outreach to dropouts or um, um, incorporating what I refer to here as recovery awareness activities like outings or, you know, uh, we had, you know, we would take walks in the park or go to baseball games or have bowling, you know, and go bowling together and, and, uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, to what extent are you helping with those other, you know, case management services like housing? So, um, so those are the, you know, the services um, uh, optimally and, uh, and, and uh, uh, essentially. Um, I'll just run through those specific, because you all probably have, as I say, it's beyond the scope of this to kind of get into what is an assessment, what is a treatment plan. You guys already know, but uh, I'll just kind of review very quickly what those are and, you know, and, and any tips I have, I'll mention those uh, and try to start to wrap up. So you want to, with an effective assessment, you certainly want to have uh, enough time to develop a relationship. And in my experience, assessment is more of a process. You're not going to get everything done in, in one meeting. You, you might need to essentially just define the, whether or not they're appropriate for treatment or whether or not you need to schedule another assessment to decide what they need and get that scheduled as soon as you can. Um, ideally, it's conversational where you're fitting the assessment into the interview versus the interview into the assessment. You all probably know what I mean by that. And, uh, and then also be an honest broker. I tell people, look, what I'm going to be recommending to you is, is not going to be something you're going to be enthusiastic about because I wouldn't be. And so I just want you to know, here's going to be the cost, the risk, the benefits, and here are the alternatives to that. Just be an honest broker. People will appreciate that honesty. Um, and oftentimes uh, that, that will also help um, elicit people's willingness to, to, uh, to go with what you recommend. And of course, focus on their, their motivators and the things that tell them that uh, they're making positive changes. Um, IOP, um, if you have the capacity with medical support to do outpatient detox, fortunately at Duke we did. Um, it can be done, so you can keep people out of a hospital if you've got a good core medical team with certain kinds of, of, uh, of detoxes, uh, alcohol being one, benzos maybe yes, maybe no, opiate being another with, uh, you know, with MAT and so on. Uh, education, you know, it's the usual psychoed stuff that we tend to do in, in treatment, so you all kind of know those are some of, the, some of the things. There's so many things that you can cover, and there are all these manualized uh, treatments that, that help guide you that... Uh, you can use. Uh, incorporating special programming. Again, know your clients. So if you're dealing with people with co-occurring uh, issues, you might have groups that are more targeted. If you have people with more case management needs, you might have services more targeted for those folks. Individual counseling. I know I, I hear this oftentimes. People ask me, should you, is it okay? It's supposed to be a group-based service and, you know, people won't pay us for individual counseling. Well, again, it should be bundled. And yes, my experience is people want one person that they can go to, who knows them the best, who can reinforce what they're doing in group and can monitor their progress and advocate for them. So I'm a big champion of that individual counseling as a core element of care. And then group we know is the core of IOT and groups only work to the extent to which they, they show up. And uh, so you can't have it be a drop in. Hey, come in when you feel like it does not, does, is not part of IOT. People have got to commit to, I'm gonna be here when I'm expected to be here. Um, and that's important. It also helps have co-facilitators. That's a lesson learned, is that, that things don't work as well if, uh, if because you know, th things can break out in a group where you have to you know, walk out of group. We do an adolescent program at Duke, and I can tell you many a time we have to have one of the co-facilitators walk a kid out who's having a meltdown in group. So you wanna have it staffed so that you've got enough support. There are of course different types of groups um, that you can do in, in IOP. It's the usual stuff. Uh, so you can kind of just view that there. And then orientation group um, in IOP, you, you know, how to succeed in, IO, in, in, in intensive outpatient treatment is, and educating people, what is this? You know, uh, and explain what, what do we do in group? What is this, why do we do it? What's it for? Because sometimes people don't understand, come to group and they might have this idea, you know, I, I'm gonna have to come sit in the middle, a group of strangers get in the middle and be yelled at. Hate to say it, sometimes people have had that experience, who knows? But you, you want to make sure people understand what they're signing up for and are well oriented and, and ready for it before you uh, induct people. Uh, group formats uh, can be open, they can be closed. I mean, you know, it varies. Um, uh, but uh, ideally, group size is, is more manageable. Um, and uh, uh, I know I've learned uh, that uh, one of the things that uh, you want to be sensitive to is you don't want to, there's a difference between a mob and a group. Education sessions might work fine for 
more than 16 people, but small groups don't. Uh, but the group, interactive group, not as well. And then you want to have good norms that govern safety and help define boundaries and so on. Uh, the standard norms, you know, here's a list of some. Uh, technology, I'll tell you, in the adolescent program particularly, has been one thing we've learned is we have to, we have a little um, treasure box. They all have to put their phones in when we start the group because otherwise they're on their phone the whole time. Uh, you know, so again, you want groups to be groups, not mobs. Um, you want the, you know, the staff itself is the key to whether or not things keep running, the trains run on time and how effective the groups really are. So you want the, the team to get together ahead of group and, you know, little huddles, you know, who are we expected tonight? What are the needs? What do we want to make sure we cover with who? And then also have maybe an after group debriefing. We will learn that works real well. Um, and, uh, and then also, who, you know, who do we need to do outreach to, who wasn't there and so on and so forth. And IOT, it should be a day-to-day -day kind of uh, review of how things are going. It should be you wait once a week. It really should be day-to-day. -day. And then community supports, I talked about this earlier, involve every, everybody that you can who might be a source of support. And a uh, great quote here uh, that we, we do need the community uh, to be part of the solution here. This is just SAMHSA slide on what a community recovery oriented system of care looks like. And, you know, so just a picture you're probably familiar with. And how do you get community buy-in? You know, different groups do it different ways, but websites, brochures, newsletters, open houses. We used to open houses and that was a good return on investment. Um, of course, you're gonna do relapse prevention and life skills training in the usual ways with the usual methods. Uh, educational groups, one of the things we've learned is keep them short. Um, long groups don't work real well. Uh, you want to check on comprehension. You know, what, what's one thing everybody's leaving this group remembering and being able to apply to their recovery today? Um, so you want, uh, you know, and you want them to be as interactive and, and engaging as possible. And, and to help sometimes to have the group members lead. You know, it could be the senior members of the group actually help mentor the other ones and, and talk about, uh, and, and talk about uh, different topics and, you know, different ways of understanding recovery skills. And then there's, of course, pharmacotherapy and different ranges of, of, uh, of, of way, different ranges of need and ways in which different um, uh, medications can be applied to support people through stabilization and craving reduction and, and recovery management. And then family, uh, hopefully you're getting from this session, which again could be a whole separate session, on, on the value of having a family-based model where everyone has a treatment plan. Now, I do know we could have a long discussion about the challenges of engaging and working with families, but uh, I will tell you that uh, the more you work at it, the, 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 the more successful you will be. And families defined here not always by blood, but again, who, who in your life would support you in this effort? Um, and families, let me tell you, families come in really in, in, in their own level of need. So in our group, we always had a separate group just for the families once a week where they could come and get support and learn how to you know, what their role is in the family and how they could establish boundaries for, uh, uh, for, enhancing, uh, for enhancing their loved one's recovery and so on. So um, anything you can do to involve families, families will benefit. Um, and uh, as I say, you have to be sometimes pretty aggressive. Uh, also, uh, uh, food helps. <laughs> uh, if you're in, able to actually, hey, we invite families on Wednesday night or one, month, uh, one night, not a month, whatever, and, and we have a cookout or we have food, people will come for, for an incentive like that. Um, and then multifamily group is something that we've had some good experience with. And it's not easy to do. You wanna have multiple staff members in the group helping with that, but uh, also um, it needs to sometimes be structured. And one of the awesome things about our experience with multifamily groups is the family started to bond and they would connect with each other outside of group. And then the whole issue of, of people engaging in 12-step and other recovery support communities should also be important. And um, as you see there, you, you know, there are a number of opportunities for that. Um, and, uh, you, you know, in, in our community, in North Carolina, where I am, we have actually a plethora of options. So we don't prescribe which group they should go to, just that we ask that you go to a minimal number of whichever one you choose or try different ones and at least know that you've tried five and you know what they're like and what to expect. And if you can bring in people who, uh, you know, can actually from those communities who can come and talk about those communities and talk about what a sponsor is and so on, that also helps with the engagement. Um, there's also evidence to show, this is one study that showed that multi, I'm sorry, engagement and mutual help groups after IOP uh, led to uh, better outcomes. 
Um, and then, you know, teaching people how to use, make good use of my meetings and so on. Um, I'm not going to tell you the importance of substance use monitoring, that you know it, but I do want to mention it is such a viable clinical tool for so many reasons, and you just don't want to make it predictable. Like every Monday we do urines, you want to mix it up a little bit, maybe do it three times in a week. It, you know, you know your population, you know what works best. Also, testing levels uh, will also tell you, particularly if you're treating people with uh, cannabis use disorders and benzo benzodiazepine use disorders. Um, so uh, with clients, clients don't oftentimes understand the benefits of, of testing, so you want to explain. Case management, you all know about that, what that is. Uh, On-call services, yeah, you're dealing with high, people with, with high-risk needs, so you know, you, you want to be set up for some kind of lifeline. And uh, just telling people to call your local emergency, go to your local emergency room, yes, that's not a bad thing to do, but it shouldn't be ideally the only thing you do. Um, uh, in our experience, rotating call by the clinicians uh, was one way we handled this, and we gave them some compensatory either pay or time off. Uh, but I will tell you, clients call it rarely, but the times they call, um, sometimes it was it was it, it resulted in saving their lives uh, because they're more apt to call people that they know than people that they don't. And then uh, a continuing care plan. Ideally, you might develop that in group with groups. Uh, you might want to have some kind of event where you transition in some celebratory way. I'm not big on the word graduation because people hear that as I'm done. We want to keep emphasizing uh, IOP is just, you know, a part of the process. It's, it's not the end of the process. And then uh, evidence-based treatments, you all know there are lots of models out there that are viable and really good and eas easily incorporated into IoT practice. Of course, I'll endorse uh, Matrix as it kind of does it all for you because it gives you session by session what you can do and it's a good fit. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna end with one, Glenn, I see you. So uh, I'll end in one minute to give you a model of an IOP and then I'll, I'll, I'll be done. So um, just kind of in summary here, uh, stage raise, range of intensity of need. So we wanna stage our treatment in the following ways and ideally having phases where you know people move back and forth with measurable objectives that define when and how they do that. Um, and then incentives and rewards to help move people uh, further through reinforcement. The structure should be however it is. Um, so I've already talked about that. And I'll just mention, you know, having a phase-based program can be really valuable because you can define, you know, so uh, for people in phase one, they should be coming more often because their needs are higher. And then the objectives are gonna be a little bit different than maybe at phase two. Uh, and you've got specific at phase one, you have some measures that tell you that people are ready for phase two. So you wanna make sure that they've done different things. These are just some examples. You could come up with your own. But in phase one, you might week by week, let's talk about, you know, as a group, you have your own group where you review how many support groups have you intended? When did you last use? Who, who have you identified to help support you in the community and so on. Uh, in phase two, again, you have specific uh, uh, objectives and uh, a certain number of days that, that hopefully is reduced in terms of relative to the phase one. We're trying to incentivize movement down by uh, having people uh, succeed in their, in their goals. And so again, you can review, you know, to what extent have you identified capital gains and vulnerabilities and threats, practice alternative therapies, and identified what was worth it. And then in phase three, you might go down now to, you know, two to three to eventually in phase four to one time a week, one or two times a week, um, you know, for whatever period of time to address goals that are more in line with uh, um, maintenance. So uh, this is just a kind of a sample. This is what I told you. If you want to kind of see how this maybe looks at out of one program um, where you have different people come on different nights for different purposes, some blended, some not blended. As I say, I'm happy to make this PowerPoint available so you can study slides like this more fully. And then there are a lot of issues in IOP, which you know better than I do, and uh, special population serve, a lot of administrative issues. And I emphasize that there are a lot of staff issues and it helps to have staff supports that uh, hopefully you're practicing and, and part, of, uh, part of a good working staff. So that said, I'm, I think I covered most of the objectives. Um, not to the fullest extent, but to some extent. And I'm going to say, for me anyway, that's the end of the didactic. <laughs>